It's time for Ask Mike Mondays. Mike answers one listener's question every week. Here's Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Ask Mike Mondays. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, as always, the smartest guy in the room, Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. So we appreciate all the questions that have come in over these last few weeks and just some great questions. And hopefully we've gotten to your question. But if we haven't, send me an email and just let me know that uh, you have a question. I should go to the oldcapitalpodcast.com. There's a form on there, Paul. That'd probably be better for them to go there. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, I make you a little more efficient in life. There you go. That's that's what you do. You do a great job. But uh, as you know, Michael is the smartest guy in the room. You know, he's purchased over four thousand apartment units. He is way in debt with two hundred fifty million dollars in Ooh, Fannie Mae yeah. loans, and he's raised over seventy five million dollars. So he is the sharpest guy that I know. So let's kind of talk a little bit about for Ask Mike Mondays the question of the week. Mike, what's the rule of thumb for employees per unit? I see a lot of smaller properties for sale, like 20 or 25 doors. How do you make money on the smaller properties? Yeah, that's uh, certainly a challenge a lot of people have. So the the smaller these deals, the less efficient they are. So that's just kind of the nature of the beast. The general rule of thumb that we use is usually somewhere between 80 to 100 units. You get one full-time employee in, one full-time employee out per every 80 units or 80 to 100. So what does that mean? That means you have one person in the office and then one maintenance person on uh, per every 80 to 100 units as a general rule of thumb. And then the bigger they are, the the easier it is. So it can tell you it's certainly easier to have a 400 unit apartment complex to operate than it is a 100 unit apartment complex. And it's certainly a lot easier to do 100 than it is 20. And so just the bigger they are, just generally speaking, the more revenue they produce. You just have more units, they just produce more revenue. So then you can afford to hire more staff and more than even just more staff, you can afford to hire better quality staff. So you can have you know, a manager that makes 60 plus thousand dollars a year, have an assistant manager, leasing agent, maybe a part-time leasing agent. Then on the outside, you can have lead maintenance, assistant maintenance, porter, make ready guy. So when you get to these smaller deals, you just can't afford it. So if you have a 20 or 30 unit deal and say Dallas, for example, you know, the amount of revenue you produce is going to be quite a bit lower. So you're going to be running this with offsite management, most likely, because you don't want to take one of your units and convert it to an office. If you only have 20 units, then that's going to take out 5% of your potential revenue. So that's not certainly a viable option. And then, you know, the amount of revenue you produce, you're going to, you know, if you hire someone full time, I mean, you can only pay them eight or $10,000 a year. So you can't afford no one worth their salt's going to work for that little amount of money. So what you typically do is you hire a management company and then they manage it offsite. So some of the things that you can help mitigate that is there's certain management companies that, especially these smaller kind of urban type deals, they manage a whole lot of them in that little area. So then you can get some economies of scale because they maybe have four or five other or 10 other apartment complexes within a mile or two radius of your property. So when you're, if you're looking to buy something like that, you need to kind of figure out, well, how the heck am I going to manage it? Who's in the area? Who's doing a good job? And that's kind of where you start for management. Some of the other things, so usually when you manage with offsite, your payroll might be a little bit lower because you don't have necessarily the onsite staff. Your management fee certainly is going to be higher. So, you know, some of these bigger deals we have, we pay 275 or 3% of gross collected revenue and management fee. And all these smaller deals, you know, six, seven, eight, nine percent sometimes, maybe even 10 even on some of these really small deals. That's that's what you're paying for your management fee. So it kind of offsets that because a lot of the stuff's done through the corporate level, as well as you're not going to have the employees on site. So if we have a leaky faucet on one of my apartment complexes, the the tenant puts in a work order, my maintenance guy goes out and corrects it. Now then they have to then go schedule and then go to the site if you have a small deal or your contract services go up quite a bit because my maintenance guy can do change out a an HVAC unit that goes out in the summer where then you're gonna have to hire an outside vendor to go do like HVAC work on, on one of these smaller deals. So those are things as well as uh, leasing becomes a little bit more challenging on a smaller deal because you need to then almost like schedule it because there's just not someone there all the time during business hours. So those are some of the challenges. So really the way you get around it is you get good management in that, that area that manages other deals. So having smaller deals in an urban setting is okay. If you're a little bit more suburban or rural and you happen to have a smaller deal, it certainly is going to be a challenge. Yeah, if you have a, a 20 unit here, another 25 unit down the street, or a, you know, 30 unit, you have some scalability. But if you just have one property, 
that's 20 doors. It doesn't seem to work. The, you know, I have difficulties trying to underwrite those type of transactions. Now, there's deals that are 20 units, say, out in Southern California or San Diego or areas like that. Those property prices are a lot more expensive than, say, the Midwest or in Phoenix or in, uh, in wherever. So, you know, you may have a lot bigger rents of two, three thousand dollars a door, but you got to put down 35 percent just for the cash flow in areas the rest of the country that uh, we can go up to higher leverage up to, say, 80 percent in some of these deals. So you can pay for it here or there. So my suggestion really is, is, is try to find a larger building, try to find a larger acquisition if you can. So it's scalable for you know, having a, a management company. Yeah, and they, these small deals are okay. They kind of, I think we refer to them as like starter properties. So if that's how you got to start out, you get in, you get out. But usually, when you buy one of these, more times than not, one of two things are going to happen: either you're going to get into it, love the business, and then want to sell it immediately and scale up, or you're going to hate the business, you want to sell it, go away, and never buy it again. So it's usually these properties tend to turn over pretty often, generally speaking, at least in, in Texas where we, we operate and live. Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, the, the smaller properties, I mean, you may see that deal trade five times in 10 years or five yeah. times in you know 12 or 13 years. They do trade frequently, so they are good starter properties. And, and another thing, too, so I I, I I harken back to a story from a year or two ago when I you know I made a loan on, I think it was a 32-unit deal back several years ago when it was, a, it was a bank financing that was open prepay. And then someone comes in and buys it a year, year and a half ago, and they go put a Fannie Mae loan on a 30-unit deal in an okay part of town, but a C-class deal, and it was barely a million-dollar loan, maybe. I'm trying to remember what the loan amount was. It was barely a million-dollar loan. And now they're stuck. Like, Because if you think about it, these smaller properties, you know, they typically just need to be bank financing because you need to have an open prepay. Because if you go back to the like episode or two when we talked about loan assumptions and supplementals, when you go in and you assume these loans, you have to have previous multifamily ownership experience. So if you're buying these little small deals and you think you're not be in this deal forever, chances are you're not, right? You're, you're going to want to sell this deal and either trade up or go away, like I just mentioned. If you put a loan with a very large prepayment penalty, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot down the road. So if you're going to get in these deals, more likely than not, you're just going to have to suck it up and take a recourse loan because these non-recourse loans are just not the right product in most cases for these deals. So that's just uh, my two cents. I like your two cents. So some great information, Mike. We appreciate that. Uh, is there anything else we should talk about? Yeah, just if everyone uh, enjoys the podcast and gets value out of it, the thing we ask that you do is give us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher. And then we have our, our Facebook page now that uh, has been getting a little bit of traction and Fantastic. we're getting a lot of likes. So we definitely appreciate that. So if you go to Facebook and search Old Capital Podcast and like our, our Facebook page, we try to give some uh, communications and updates about upcoming events that we host, as well as uh, we have re- new podcasts released. Uh, we we post them on there as well. Great information, Mike. Thanks uh, for hanging with the Ask Mike Mondays. I'm Paul Peoples. That was Michael Becker. Have a great day.